Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B, and we are continuing our conversation on the great poet William Butler Yeats, W.B. Yeats. And we're now in our hymnals on page 1147, and we are now looking at, really, in many people's minds, the greatest poem that Yeats ever wrote, Sailing to Byzantium. I want to start uh, by just making a quick observation. The great American poet, X.J. Kennedy, who was also a great anthologizer of poetry, so for example, when university textbooks wanted to compile the greatest poems of all time, maybe the top thousand poems of all time, they came to a guy like Kennedy to, to make that book. And in an interview, apparently, Kennedy was asked, uh, what is the greatest poem in the English language? And the interviewer thought, wow, I've thrown this guy for a loop. I mean, he's obviously read millions of poems to be able to write these anthologies where he's collected all these poems, and, and he'll probably give me some philosophic answer like, well, the best depends upon blah, 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 blah. And we're, and we're told that Kennedy, who's read a lot of poetry in his life, just looked back at the interviewer really quickly and said, the greatest poem in the English language is W.B. Yeats sailing to Byzantium. Now, I say that in advance because some students, when they look at this poem for the first time, are like, yeah, just don't see that. So I'll maybe come to this poem asking, why is this considered such a really important poem? It's considered a really great poem. The second thing I want to do is to help you understand the poetry of Yeats as being an inherent, I'm going to use an academic term now, dialectic. Dialectic. Between two opposites. Now for me to use the term dialectic, I'm using a term by the great German philosopher Hegel, who said something like this. When you study the world of ideas, it's interesting how ideas evolve. First you'll have what he called a thesis, the first idea. That thesis has its diametric opposite, let's call it B, in the anti thesis or antithesis, the opposite. Got me? And Hegel, the great German philosopher, said that when you look at the history of ideas in the world, they kind of are formed this way, where on the one hand you have a great idea, we'll call it a thesis. You have a second great idea, we'll call it its opposite, the antithesis, and these begin to fight back and forth, ergo the term for your notes, dialectic. It just simply means fight or struggle. Dialectic means struggle. A struggle back and forth. Hegel was the one who pointed this out. He said what's fascinating about this dialectic movement is that over time there is a third option that we will call C. This he called synthesis. That is to say a bringing together a little bit of the thesis a little bit of the antithesis, they come together to form a synthesis, and if you're continuing with Hegel, he said then that synthesis becomes the new thesis, which then has its diametric opposite in the antithesis, and then a new synthesis. And Hegel said, as a student of history, that this is kind of the way ideas come about, that you get one idea, which has its opposite, and out of that dialectic comes a third option, a synthesis, and then out of that synthesis, a new thesis is born with its diametric opposites, etc., etc. Now, I want us to apply this Hegelian dialectic that I just put on the whiteboard to the poetry of W.B. Yeats. And you'll be doing this if you're writing a paper on his view of, uh-oh, what would the A be? Change, his view of change. Change seems to be constant. You are not the person that you started high school. You're not. But on the other hand, there's the opposite of that what we will call stasis, or stability, unchanging, that which seems to not so easily change. And the tension, of course, is understood in Yeats's poetry in the two, moving back and forth. So see, I can ask a really interesting question at 3B. Of the two, change, constant change, stability, no change, which do you think is more important in the history of the world? See, he he Hegel would say that's a majorly loaded question, right? It almost seems like you can't have one without what? Somehow having the other as well. Right, right, right. Let's take a look 
at the poetic rendering of this concept in Yeats's poem, Sailing to Byzantium. Now, before we get started, a couple of bits of information that will help you. One, Byzantium. Of course, it is the name of a very famous city. Today, it's called Istanbul. For many years, it was called Constantinople. Of course, Byzantium is a famous city of art. Of art. This city set at a major crossroads. It was one of the great cities of high Christian religion. Major cathedrals are built there. Are you ready for this? At one point, we're told that every roof of that city, of a major building, was lined with gold. Gold. They put it on the roofs of their city buildings. And when the sun came up in the morning, and it hit the city, the city glowed like it was on fire. Of course, the bad news was, all that gold attracted lots of invaders. And the city of Byzantium has over the years often been invaded, specifically, often for its art and its, right, by extension, the bank that would attend that art, right? Byzantium, Istanbul, Constantinople, for Yates, begins to symbolize, and that's a key word, symbolize a perfect place. Dare we call it heaven or paradise. An ideal place, we might say. The academic term is utopia, a place that cannot be considered any great Byzantine. Number two, about this poem. Go to 2B real quickly, and we're going to point out that in the Victorian spirit of things, Yeats is working with a dramatic monologue. Uh-oh, we're going to write that term down and remind ourselves one more time, and at 3A we're going to have any number of titles that immediately jump to mind when we hear the term dramatic monologue. We'll think of Tennyson's Ulysses. We'll think of Browning's both, Last Duchess, as well as, do you remember? I used to love her, but I had to kill her. Right, Prophyra's lover. These, of course, will immediately come to mind, and now we will have one more great dramatic monologue. Remember two things about a dramatic monologue. One, we want to identify who the speaker is. Two, we want to identify what the context, dramatic context is, the words the speaker is speaking. Now I'm going to help you out here because we don't have a lot of time. The speaker of this poem is an old man. The speaker of this poem is in a boat all alone, leaving the shore, going out into the ocean, and he looks back at the shore, and he begins to speak about the country that he's leaving. And about that country, he then will speak the following words. That is no country for old men. Let's now look at the poem itself, and let's hear a reading of the poem, followed by an exegesis. At level one, though, and hello, I'm teaching you how to read. So very quickly, at level one, you will want to pay attention on 1147, 1148. Do you see that the stanzas are numbered? Roman numeral one, two, three, turn the page to 1148, and four. So it would only make sense at level one that you would want to jot down these four numbers, skip a few lines, and as we go through the process of exegesis, we'll ask what specifically is being said in each one of these parts of the poem. Let's now turn to the poem itself on 1147. We'll do a reading of the poem, and then we'll have a, a, a brief session of exegesis. 1147, William Butler Yeats's Sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. Young in one another's arms, the birds in the trees, those dying generations of their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long. Whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that central music, all neglect monuments of an aging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. 
And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to this holy city of Byzantium. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, turn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal that knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamel to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing the lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Now one more time I will say, often what students will say, you're telling me that the great American poet X.J. Kennedy said this is one of the greatest poems in the English language of all time? I am, that's what I'm saying. Well, I clearly missed one or two things in the reading, sir, sorry. That's okay. Let's now turn to the poem, and let's begin to investigate a few observations that an old man on a boat sailing away will say about the country he's leaving, that is no country for old men. The great American writer Cormac McCarthy will title his great novel, No Country for Old Men, which most of you, if you know it at all as a title, you know it because it's an Academy Award winning film of what, three or four years ago, No Country for Old Men. This line, very famous line, wait a minute, the old man's on a boat sailing away and he says about the country he's leaving, that is no country for old men. Whoa, 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 write it down. What's happening right away? We can kind of deduce it. Being on a boat, sailing away, equals what? What's the old man about to do? He is. Sailing away equals death. Write it down. The old man's about to die. And as he's ready to die, he says something fascinating about the world from which he comes. I, when I first came to this town, I pointed out the irony. That in, some of you will say, wow, I guess I haven't thought about that. In one building in this town, I said, the most young, the most dynamic, the most youthful, and right across the street, in another building, the oldest of the town, waiting only to die. Isn't that odd? And I pointed out the dark irony of this. Imagine, there are people right now sitting in that structure over there, waiting to flatline. Dude, that's the only reason they're there. You don't go there so you can get well. The only reason they put you in that place is, it's over. They're waiting for the person to die so they can put a new person in the bed in that room. Sorry, that's the point of an old folks home. But they have windows at that place that face out in the direction of this building. And some of the people right now sitting in that building sat in this very room. And they put the two structures across the street from each other. And I said, what were they thinking? Dark irony. Let's put people in that building to look at this building and look at you. Of course, there is the realization. Someday, <laughs> see, you don't stay in 303 forever. That is no country for old men. Have you noticed how the world you're growing up in is not a world for old farts? Think about beer commercials. They tell us a lot, don't they? When was the last time you saw a beer commercial where you saw a bunch of old farts ready, ready to, no, if I come. Well, think about all. He hello, all of a sudden it hits on my seniors like, dude, you're absolutely right. If you watch any TV, you watch commercials. And if you watch commercials, what kinds of people do you see for the most in those commercials? See what he says? The young. Right? Keep reading, because Beck's right. The young in one another's arms. Oh, yes. That's what this world is about. It's about a world that's not for the old. It's a world for the young in one another's arms. Birds in the trees singing. Look at the next line. Those dying generations at their song. Has the thought occurred to you, just a few days from graduation, that you are a dying senior? See, some of you will see, hear this line and you'll say, well, 
this is like really grotesque. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Unless you're planning on being a high school senior forever, your time of being a senior is almost over. Can I use the word die? I can, and I will. Because it has an interesting ring to it. Because once, you're a dying eighth grader. Now that does seem like a long time ago. Right? In other words, what's the point we're making about life? We're always working in these circles, aren't we? They are constant, and yet they're ever-changing. Did you hear what I just said? You were an eighth grader once. Now you're not. You're a high school senior once. Pretty soon you'll say, no, I'm not. And then you'll just keep going. Right? Life is this way. But what kind of life in the world you live? Well, it's a, it's a world for young people, not for old people. The young in one another's arms. The birds are in the trees, but we don't recognize it that they're already dying. Dying generation at their song. The salmon falls. Are you reading it with me? The salmon falls. The macro crowded seas. Fish, flesh, or fowl. That's pretty much everything that lives on this planet, huh? Fish, flesh, or fowl. Commend all summer long. And then here's the great circle of life for the Disney Lion King fans in the house. Whatever is, there's your life. Begotten. Two people had to hook up and exchange fluids for you to be sitting here. Born. On the day you were born. See, this is weird. This doesn't occur to most of my seniors. On the day you were born, there were other people who were born, and some of them didn't make it. Some of them didn't make it that day, and some of them didn't make it to this moment. Look at the last one. And dies. That's the existence. That is the human condition. Whatever is begotten, born, and dies. There it is. Yeats says, that's what this world is all about. You're only young for a very short period of time. And then guess what? You're not. And then guess what? Begotten, born, and dies. And yet, Yeats says something very interesting. I, I have seniors that, that hear this poem, and they go, you know, once I start to understand this poem, I realize this is kind of an insult. This poem is kind of an insult poem. It's kind of a wake-me-up kind of poem. It's the kind of poem strange to read on a Monday morning when we have other thoughts on our brain. Really? What kind of other thoughts than whatever is begotten, born, and dies? Take a look at what he says next. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of an aging intellect. That is a fascinating line. The word picture is that young people are like fish caught in a net and cannot get free. Look what he says about you. Caught in that sensual music. All neglect. Monuments of unaging intellect. Do you remember my little drawing that we used on the whiteboard a few lectures ago? I think we did. If we didn't, remind me of it. A lot of times when I do this, students immediately remember it. Do you remember this model where we had two boxes? Do you remember this? Yeah. Above the first box, we had the word from Plato's perspective, images. We can use the term physical, right? So physical. Above here, you'll remember ideas, concepts. Do you remember this? So for example, we could talk about a beautiful body, or we could talk about beauty itself. We could talk about Ruthie's tree, or we could talk about nature and the energy of nature. Do you remember this project? Do you remember what we said about this first box of or related to the what? Five senses. Do you remember that? Oh, you can see it, you can touch it, you can taste it, etc., etc. So, for example, back to his poem, the young in one another's arms, it's the difference between the exchange of fluids and this thing we'll call love. But look what he says about young people, and this is fascinating. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. Now, I don't want to upset back here, but I'm going to say it anyway. I may be wrong about this, but I think I'm right. In 200 years, probably nobody's listening to the music of Miley Cyrus. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend. I don't want to offend. But my guess is, are you ready for this? Stay with me, though. I'm making a really profound point. In a couple hundred years, do you get this sense? Probably 
her time comes and goes. But I can pretty much predict that in 200 years, they'll still be listening to the music of Beethoven and Mozart. I'm not asking you whether you like the music of Beethoven and Mozart. I'm making an observation that is hypothetical about the future. And in 200 years, I doubt seriously anybody's listening to that music, but I got a hunch they're still listening to the music of Beethoven, Mozart. Now this is a really interesting 3B question I want you to write in your notes. <coughs> Beethoven and Mozart can kind of reference as a monument of unaging, doesn't seem to age intellect, right? Question. I'd like to, I'm going to ask a series of these, so that's why you're getting ready to write down at 3B. Don't worry, this is a challenge. One or two of my seniors say it's one of the more powerful challenges McGee ever throws at us. Go ahead, I dare you to try this little exercise with me. Your pen should be ready now, 3B. I'm going to ask you a simple question. You were born roughly, what, 94, 95, right? So now your timing for the answers to the question I'm going to ask have got to roughly start right about, right about 1990. Got me? Question. What music that has been written and performed in your lifetime are you willing to predict will still be listened to in 300 years? Write down at least one band, one title, one musician even. Don't say it, write it. Go ahead, I challenge you. At least one. Is there a single musician in your lifetime that you're willing to predict legitimately. I mean, if you want, you can write Miley Cyrus down. But I'm asking a legitimate prediction. Is there a music group? Is there a song even from your generation that will make it 200 years? Let's keep going. Let's again. Uh, students have a tendency to want to say these. I'm challenging you to write these. Forget about saying them. We can talk about that later. I just want you to try and write this down. I'll, I'll go to the second one. Okay, well, maybe it's not for you music, so let's keep going. How about, see, this starts to become a more interesting question. I can tell some of you are already thinking, what about a movie? Jot down a single movie title. Go ahead. Jot down a single. And, and again, your tendency is to say something. Don't say it right. What is a single movie title? that was made after 1990 that you believe will still be watched in 200 years. I'll keep going. Some of you raised, of course, in the great age of gaming. So let's ask this question. If they're still gaming in 200 years, is there a single game that you have played in your lifetime that will still be played in 200 years? See, we're asking a very interesting question. Go ahead, write it down. Do you think of a single one that you think might make it, right? By the way, hello? I'm not asking you what you like. I'm asking you what will stay. Some of you will have to admit that what you want to write down because it's what you like, a musician, a movie, a video game, you have to be honest, probably isn't going to last 200 years. Probably not going to make it. What about a book that you read in your lifetime? Have you read a book that was published since 1990? Go back and look at the line. Caught in that sensual music all... What's the word? What's the word? Caught in that sensual music all what? That's the word. Monuments of an aging intellect. What is he saying about young people? Now write that down. We're back at level one, two A. What is he saying about young people? Young people have, watch my whiteboard. Young people have a tendency to be interested in which one of these two boxes up here. Everything is about that right there. Why? Because they're young, that's why. But, but, there are these things called monuments of unaging intellect. What does the term unaging mean? Does not, right? See how that works? Now we're back to your paper, huh? Right? Does not change. Young people have a tendency to not be interested in those monuments. They are far more interested in the stuff of the senses. 
They only can see what is their own time, what is their own interest. But that's simply because they have forgotten that across the street from this structure is a different structure. A structure you, many of you, have driven past all your life and never even considered. Someday you're there. Go ahead and say it won't be you. That makes it even more powerful when you are looking out the window. Do you honestly believe those people sitting in that structure at your age, 17, said, I can hardly wait to grow up and get so old, nobody can take care of me, i got to go to this place. Do you honestly believe that? Do you honestly believe anyone thought they would ever get that old? Why not? Because young people have a tendency to neglect. Neglect? What does that mean, neglect? Right? They can't see it. Can't see what? Stanza two. An aged man is but a paltry thing. A tattered coat upon a stick. Uh-oh, where it's scarecrows. You might write this one down. These poets like scarecrows. From a distance they look what? Real. Real, correct? Up close they look what? Nay, real. Right? See how that works, right? But the word picture is an interesting one. A few days ago, I could have done this. I can't do it now. A few days ago, I could have done this. I could have taken one of those leaves off, Ruth, off Ruthie's tree that were all brown, right? And I put it in my hand. Watch this. I put it in my hand. I do one of these numbers. Where's the leaf? That's called paltry. Now, when that leaf was brand new in June, July, I couldn't have done that. I would take that green leaf, put it in my hand, and do this, and I just have green all over, right? What's the difference? What happens in October that makes that thing that once was alive, a green leaf, now poultry? Uh, there's your second part. Read it with me. Some of you are going, whoa, 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 this is a profound poem. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat up on a stick, unless, you see the next word? Back to my whiteboard. Are you reading it with me? Some of you are saying, well, you know what? I can't even read this poem because I'm so much thinking about the other stuff. And Oh, yeah, it's called being young, huh? I can't even focus for 30 minutes on what this cat's staying in his poem because I'm so busy thinking about all... Caught in that central music called neglect, monuments of an aging intellect. Take a look at my whiteboard again. You have the body that you'll put in the first box. What are you going to have in the second yeah, you are. You're going to put spirit there or soul there, right? Yates is going to argue there's two of you. There's not one. There's two of you. There is your body. And that, of course, is in that first box. But your body is like that leaf. In June, unbelievably green and alive. A few days later, gone. But interestingly, if you believe in this thing called soul, the soul does not age the way the body ages. And as the soul starts to see the body is getting older, the soul starts doing one of these numbers. Yes! I don't understand. Yes, why? Because the soul wants to be free of the body. Go back and look at the lines. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tattered in its mortal dress. In other words... As the body starts to get older, the soul starts to go, yay, we finally get to sail away. Nor is there singing schools, but studying monuments of the known magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. The soul wants to escape the body because the body deteriorates and dies. Have you met any 200-year-old people? That should tell you something except for the fact that you're young and stupid. Neglects. When we're young, we're stupid. Why come? We're in each other's arms. It's the, uh, that's all there is. Or we would like to be in each other's arms. That's our little paper we handed out in Orange Period today. You see, right? Some of us hoping, desperately hoping for something called a soul mate. Don't you find it interesting? They don't call it body mate. They call it soul mate. By the way, those of us who shake our head the most about saying no way to soulmates probably are the ones that long for it the most. 
All right, see how that works? Stanza three. Stanza three. Uh, see, see, how, see how monkey mind works? Monkey mind is strange, huh? All it takes is just a split, and then all of a sudden, a youth's mind, pew, off and running, 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 burst into trees. Those dying generations at their songs. See how that works? Squirrel, that's right, squirrel, right, right, right. But here's the funny thing. As you age, you start to learn how to focus a little bit more. Look at the third stanza. A sage is an old fart. But not just an old fart, an old fart with wisdom. Write it down. What is wisdom? Is wisdom the same thing as knowledge? It's not, is it? What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is stuff you know. Wisdom is how you use it. Right? A sage is an old fart who has wisdom. And the speaker of our poem says... I'd like to go where all those old farts that now are dead are, so I could have them teach me something. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire, as in a gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, purn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. I'd like to have the old farts teach me something that I can really learn. Consume my heart away. This is a word picture that blows away a lot of seniors when they get it. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. You don't see it because you're young and stupid. But you're walking the halls of this high school, dragging a dead body behind you. It's there. You just can't see it. Dragging everywhere you walk. This dead body is following you. This corpse is following you. What? What are you talking about? I don't see... Well, you don't see it because you ain't looking for it. Your soul wants to be freed of this rotten corpse that is your body. Uh-uh, I got no rotten corpse. I looked in a mirror this morning. There ain't nothing rotten about me. <laughs> yeah, not for long. An aged man... Is but a paltry thing. In June, Ruthie's tree had leaves. Go ahead, look at it. I made the observation a few weeks ago because I knew I'd come back to it. Notice how many leaves there are on that tree. <laughs> and you honestly think you don't pull around a corpse. Yates says, I get it. It's because you're young. And therefore neglect. Neglect what? Anything... That really matters. But that's okay. Because tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It's just a matter of time. Just like it was just a matter of time when you were a ninth grader that you would be sitting in this room. Yeah. Just a matter of time. Of course, when you're a ninth grader, that seems like a long ways out. When you look back now, it doesn't seem that long ago. Question. That was only three years ago. What will three years from now be? If you're still alive. What do you mean if I'm still alive? Well, whatever is begotten, born, dies. This can be an unsettling concept <coughs> to the young. Yeats is aware of that. And so he offers an interesting element of hope in an eschatological view, a, a view of afterlife, that posits not a linear view, where you live, you die, and then that's it, but rather a cyclical view, where you live, you die, and then your soul comes back to do it all over again. But are you ready for this? Your soul can hold on to enough information from previous lives to maybe figure out some stuff. And over time, you actually start to get wiser as you go through these lives. Yeats says it this way. O sages, stanza three. O sages standing in God's holy fires in a cold <coughs> mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, Turn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart, think soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity where all the other souls go. He says, I'm, I'm kind of interested in what that experience is going to be like. When I'm no longer a body, but only a soul. What will that be like? Once stands a four. Out of nature. Uh-oh, what's that mean? Once I'm what? Once out of nature means what? Once I'm, uh, once I'm dead, right. Once out of nature, 
I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. Oh, what are we talking about here? If you have to come back, Gates says, if I have to come back into some kind of life form again, right? He says you got an option. Option A, come back as something living. He says, I don't want to come back as anything living. How come? Why does he want to come back as something living again? Because it's going to go through it again. And then again. And then again. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. Well, if you can't come back as something living, what would he like to come back as? But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths. What's a Grecian? Overrelated to? The city of Greece, the, the, the nation of Greece, right? He wants to come back as what? He wants to come back as a monument of unaging intellect. He doesn't want to come back as something alive, because to come back as something alive means that sooner or later it must sail away. It's got to die. To that degree, he says, I'd rather come back as something like a work of art, a hammered gold that a Grecian goldsmith might make, of a hammered gold, a gold enamel keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set up on a golden bough to lords and ladies to sing of what is past or passing and to come, those people in Byzantium. Now to finish. This poem resurrects some very interesting observations. Can I say it in a number of different ways? Seniors over the years have written some of these quotes down, one or two of them even making it to Omega Files and the like. Yates says it this way, you're old, I'm sorry, you're young until you're not, which is an interesting thing if you'll think about it. See, right now you think of yourself as young, but that's because you've forgotten what it was like to be in fifth grade. A fifth grader looks at you not as young. Think about that. When you were in fifth grade, you did not see the students I was lecturing in 303 as young. When you went to their ball games and you were in fourth and fifth grade, you did not see the basketball players out there on the court as young. You saw them as old. Right? Just like your parents were old. Just like your teachers were old. You're young until you're not. But the next question is more intriguing. When do you stop being young and start being old? We have language like youth, middle age, old age. Yates has an interesting view. He says the body ages, not the soul. The soul remains almost younger and younger. It gets excited, giddy, as the body starts to wear out because it wants to be emancipated, it wants to be free. Are you ready for this? In the same way that you can hardly wait for graduation day to happen here in a few days, your soul can hardly wait for your death. Because when you finally are laid into the ground or burned up in some kind of funeral pyre, your soul will finally be free of your body. But free to do what? Now that begs another interesting question. If you had to come back into this world one more time to live, would you choose to come back as a thing living? Or would you choose to come back as a work of art? See, think about it. The artist, like Yeats, can write this poem and then die. You don't know anything about Yeats. Maybe a picture you stumble across on, online or something. But you read his poem. In other words, the art outlast the artist. Would it be better to come back as a work of art? Or would it better to be come back as something that's alive and living? Namely, the artist himself herself. If you had to choose, which one would you rather come back as and why? Finally, let's go ahead and jot it in our notes. How does this poem have anything to do with the Hegelian concept of dialectic? Go ahead, jot it down. I'm helping you write your paper. How does this poem have anything to do with the Hegelian idea of dialectic? That there is this thing called change on the one hand. There is this thing called changelessness on the other hand. And there seems to be a struggle or a tension or a dialectic between the two. What does this poem seem to suggest about that? And the ways in which the human condition is constantly a struggle between on the one hand the recognition of the need for change, and on the other hand, the longing for a monument of an aging intellect. Do you think, in the end, that you will create a monument of an aging intellect before you go? And what will that be? And what if it's your life? Uh -huh.